Hey, yo, what's up? This is Ice-T, represent for Hype Magazine. Stop playing. Hey, what's good, everybody? Welcome to another live session with the Hype Magazine. I'm your editor-in-chief, Jerry Doby, and today I have the distinct honor of being with a, a lion in the streaming television game and the sports game by the name of Jonathan Nastas. He is the CEO of Clash TV. Clash TV has got some exciting, exciting news. You know, the timed with the, the 50th anniversary of hip hop, they brought in Fat Joe as their first ever commissioner of basketball and a streetball, streetball commissioner. Let me get, let me get it right. Streetball commissioner. Uh, and, that makes sense because they just signed an agreement with and one uh, to help revive the brand's iconic mixtape tournament. So today, Jonathan is going to give us a little look from the inside, looking out about himself. What's the de defining moment that brought him to this six months ago and uh, what fun we're having. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Jerry. Great to be here. Great to be with Hype Magazine and your audience. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, appreciate it, appreciate it. All right, from the inside looking out, talk to us about Jonathan Anastas. Sure. So I joined Clash TV six months ago. Coming from a background of sports, I was global CMO for one championship, which is the UFC for the rest of the world, MMA. And stints in video games, I ran digital globally for Activision. I was the chief marketing officer at Atari. I also ran the Guitar Hero business unit for, uh, for a minute. And music, I worked for a live streaming service that did concerts called Live by Live. So to me, looking at you know the most important content in the world of streaming video for Gen Y and Gen Z, it's gaming and esports, it's music and it's sports. And I've had the benefit and the experience of working across all three of those pillars and I'm passionate about all three of them. And this felt like a, a place to bring all my experience together, right? Like high passion sports like streetball brings the best of culture and sports together. You know, you referenced we brought on Fat Joe. There's a long history of music in the New York streetball space. There's a long history of gaming and streetball intersecting. We just had a, uh, a, a tournament, an NBA 2K tournament with 10 influencers yesterday celebrating the Gersh Championship game where they were playing on Gersh in NBA 2K. So, you, you know, we're, we're in a place where all these things have come together to celebrate this amazing culture. And I feel fortunate to be a part of it. You know, with the advent of this newer technology and the VR and the supporting AI and all this other stuff that someone with as much gray as I have is still trying to grasp and understand what's going on. I'm watching my kids um play these games and get in these rooms and things like that what is the most exciting for you about watching you know the streaming world co-mingle with the live event world and hip-hop and music overall period and guitar hero was my favorite game when i played them thank you Thank you. It was, an, it was an amazing game to work on. It taught me a lot about how the music business works and how early virality around music works. But to sort of go back to your question, right, about what is the special way about, you know, using technology to lever on top of events. I think the first thing is, you know, traditionally, streetball was events for hundreds, if not thousand people, right? And with a platform like Clash TV, we try to capture all the energy and the attitude you get on those courts but take events that were maybe had 300 people, 400 people and make them events for 10,000 people, 20,000 people. We hope someday millions of people, you know, help these athletes get the recognition that they deserve around the world for the amazing work they do on the courts and help these leagues get recognized around the world for the amazing motivation and inspiration they bring to their communities. So really the ability to scale these events is one of the things that we think is most special. Another one is the interactivity layer, you know, the ability to communicate with fans around the world and build virtual relationships with fans around the world where you might have Gersh in common with somebody halfway across the planet or Rutgers, you know, in common with somebody halfway across your city or Dykeman in common with somebody across the country or Drew League in common with somebody across the country. It's a way to build and foster these relationships, you know, especially in a time like the pandemic virtual relationships became hugely important to keeping people sane and healthy and happy 
and you know both the scale and the interactivity is probably what what adds a special layer to this okay and for you folks out there thinking that it's all about the men's side of the game uh class just also signed a multi-deal deal partnership with drew women's league of as part of the famed la based drew league but the women are not forgotten everybody's included is respected it, it's some exciting things going on uh Talk to me about bring Fat Joe. Fat Joe has made songs about basketball and we see the famous videos about basketball. And now he's come on not only as an advisor, but as an actual investor. So he's putting his money where his mouth is. For those who have been talking bad about Joe, y'all kiss my grits. The man is out here moving and shaking and actually doing things to further the culture and things that he believes in. So talk to me about how that came together, Jonathan, and uh, what it feels like to partner with such a powerhouse. So Joe early in our relationship has been nothing but amazing. You, you know, his bona fides in this space go back 20 years, 30 years. You spoke to that. We were introduced to Joe through another legend who was involved in our, in our company Chris Scotty Lorenzo, you know, co-founder of Murder Inc. Right. Also a guy who's been on these courts for 20 or 30 years. For those of you who don't know, Chris is also an investor and on our board and is an as a member of the management team, the operational management team. You know, Chris is a is my business partner in okay. this venture, you know, and Chris is the one who introduced us to Joe and they built their relationship on these same courts, you know, 25 years ago. And so Joe brought passion for the space, experience in the space, saw what Chris saw over Chris's involvement in the last two years with Clash TV, and brings his great mind as a businessman and a cultural activator. And that's what we really look forward to, right? Like Joe's a guy with, you know, maybe six, seven million social media followers. He's had a career that spanned decades, in, you know, in a, in a career where people tend to come and go and it's hit driven and you're gone, to, you're here today and gone tomorrow. Joe has been able to stay relevant, build relevancy, you know, rebuild, you know, my seven-year-old son, you know, streams Fat Joe at home, right? You know, it's a, <laughs> right. right? So what I want to tap into is not just Joe's understanding of the space and basketball, but Joe's understanding of culture and Joe's reach in culture and Joe's understanding of marketing and, and how, to, how to grow brands. And we hope to really reap the benefit of, of 360 Joe, so to speak. Mm. Streetball holds a, a, a special place in a lot of people's hearts, especially within the hip hop community, the urban community as a release, a way to, you know, for some of the NBA players to, to come home and clown a little bit and without all the restrictions of, of you know, the organized leagues and whatnot. Not that uh, the street ball leagues aren't organized, but they get to be creative with the game that they love. And um, I hear that your quote is saying uh, that your mission to own the category of street ball. Um, there was some explosive moments in the, in the you know, especially with N one and the mixtapes thing. Of um, how do you look to recapture that and revitalize that? Talk to me about uh, the action plan. Well, here's what I'd say. It's not about revitalizing. I don't think the vitality and the importance in the communities ever left. You know, there's a lot of things with sports where things fall in and out of broad cultural favor. You, you, you know, let's, let, I'm going to give you an odd analog, right? Professional wrestling. Like people talk about wrestling being in or wrestling being out. Wrestling never actually goes away, right? Wrestling's in the top 10 rated shows whether it's in the broader pulp lexicon or not, whether they have a movie star like The Rock or John Cena or they don't, right? Wrestling is always there for hardcore wrestling fans. And I don't want to sit here and in any way paint street ball as ever not being relevant, not being vital. In the communities of which it's lived, it has never lost its vitality. What we hope to do is shine a bigger light on it and give it the larger cultural re relevance it deserves. I, you know, I've lived in New York three different times in my life, generally been a downtown guy. I have never been able to walk past the cage on West 4th and not stop on a weekend, yeah. right? Whether I was like coming to the gym or going to the gym, like it just draws you in, right? Right, And, and that draw 
deserves such a bigger light and such a larger audience. And those players deserve a better living. And those communities deserve better parks with better lighting, right? And better equipment. And if we can help bring it, you know, I mean, it's so interesting. You know, my son is seven. And I was telling Baron last time I saw Baron, you know, the first time my son ever saw anybody dunk a basketball was on your court at Slick Studios. And he talked about it for weeks, wow. right? It became like a cultural moment, you know? Mm-hmm. It, be, it became something that's like sort of burned in his retina, right? Burned into his brain. And we just want to burn that into millions of people's brains. That's what we're here to do. So if we can shine a light and bring some money back to these communities, these players, these leagues, we will have accomplished our mission. So alongside the entertainment value, there's a corporate citizen mission as well by helping to buttress these uh, cultural activities within the communities and help, you know, say, hey, look, there's a great pool of alternate talent besides the NBA and uh, Cube isn't the only one that has a, a an alternate lane uh, to the to what we consider the status quo within uh, professional basketball. So I love it, and I appreciate that. I, I was never a basketball fan. First of all, because I couldn't play, no matter how much they tried to teach me. Uh, and I actually made a, a basketball team, but I I rode the bench. I might as well have been, you know, the trainer towel kid, right? But uh, I had fun just with the camaraderie of the team and even practicing and, and you know, being the butt of some jokes because, you know, what they say, black man can't jump. I was guilty and I was unashamed that I was trying and having a great, great time. So uh, from the, the heart part of basketball and the sport, I loved it. But the technicality, I was like, I'm not good at it. So I'll just go with football. And uh, but. As you said earlier, in the communities, those are the gathering spots. And those are the places where you earn bragging rights. We don't have, you know, street rap battles anymore. We have, you know, what can you do on the court? How creative? I'm watching the kids from eight, nine, 10 years old do some amazing things to the adults. So um, once again, corporate citizenship, shining a light on something and helping people feed their families by, you know, doing this and making a little bit of change. So what are we looking forward to in 2023? Well, first I I want to put sort of an exclamation point on your, your, your point about corporate citizenship. So if you streamed some of the game last night, right, you saw Joe in the court, Baron on the court, Amazon music on the court, Amazon music was kind enough because they believe in telling community stories And, you know, Shining Lights and Communities, they and Slick funded grants that we helped select who the recipients were, you know, through streaming performance this year. You know, we we sort of sat with Amazon, we sat with Barron. They had strong POVs on which parks, but we were able to throw a data layer in there, right? Like, here are the parks with the highest viewership per game. Here are the parks with the highest engagement rate. Here are the parks with the highest number of comments. Here are the parks with the highest number of likes you know, seeing what we streamed over the last couple of years. And, you know, we're a conduit to the monetization of these leagues in these parks because we rev share pay-per-view with them. We rev share, you know, advertising and sponsorship deals with them. And so, you know, while last night it was Amazon's corporate largeness and Barron's corporate largeness, we had a role as the streaming partner and also as the data layer to kind of, you know, add a quantitative look you know, and how to sort of force rank these parks and sort of what they mean to their communities. So we literally saw that happen on the on the court last night. In terms of what you're going to see for the remainder of 2023, you, you mentioned our mission is to own street basketball. We're streaming 15 street basketball leagues so far this year, which we believe is is a great deal more than than anybody else. You, you know, you're going to see the balance of the championship games through August. You're going to see basketball sunset for a minute, right? As, it, as sort of streetball goes out of season, we're going to come back with some surprise basketball news for everybody in the fall. That I'm not ready to do anything more but tease now. Okay, but okay. we've got. Uh, hope hopefully you and I can get can get together again towards the end of September and talk about what our fall basketball plan is. But we've got something 
something exciting planned with the same idea. How can we put a light on players, given the new NIL rules, organizations that are sub-professional, right, that need funding to continue their work, to continue player development, and help them find audience and money? Okay. Yeah. Earlier on, I didn't want everybody to think I just totally hate basketball. The only reason why I like basketball now is because of streetball. The amazing combinations that come out of there, people's broken ankles and just clowning whole teams. That's the exciting part. It's action packed, like a really great boxing match. You know what I mean? The ebb and flow is crazy and, and watching some of the antics. That is what brings people like me who otherwise wouldn't watch it, bring it to the entertainment part. And by the way, I feel the same way, right? So the NBA has this incredible player quality on the court, right? And the energy in a, in a place, you know, is amazing. But here's what I will say about streetball, and it ties back to and one. So there's a level of creativity and authenticity that happens in streetball that's kind of been polished out of the NBA, and, you know, you referenced And One, and I'll tell you how we ended up partnered with And One because it's an interesting story. So we were out trying to raise money. And as we were sitting down with venture capitalists and family offices, you know, we, we tell our story and people would stop and think for a minute. And they'd say, so what you're saying is you're And One for the streaming era, right? Because if you think about And One was literally passing out VHS tapes. Yeah. So after we heard this the fifth time, the sixth time, I literally cold called the CEO of And One, and said, I really felt like I need to talk to you because people keep referencing And One when we're not trying to raise money and that you guys did 25, 30 years ago what we're trying to do now. And his response was, this is a very interesting time to call. We're celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Open Runs and we're streaming two games to start, a park in Philadelphia because Philadelphia is the home of And One. Okay. And the famous kingdom in Harlem mm. and what can we do together? And what we decided to do together, because they were already going to throw events, as we said, the street ball was generally like events for hundreds or an event for a thousand. We sort of said, how can we literally make this an event for millions? And so they ran the event, they coordinated the event, they creative directed the event. We came in with what I would call the broadcast layer. Okay. Right. We came in with like, we're going to bring the cameras in. We know how to do this at, at, right, at Rucker, at Dykeman, at Gersh. We're going to plus it up. Let's talk about doing interviews, you know, in between segments, you know, against the step and repeat, chop that up, put it on social. And we got almost 600,000 live streams for the event from Philadelphia. And then we got almost 800,000 live streams for the event from Kingdom because Kingdom is Kingdom, right? And New York City is New York City and the home of Streetball. And so together as partners, we had an incredible celebration for the 30th return of, of, the, of the open runs. And obviously, we couldn't have done it without their brand equity, their brand value, and their incredible logistics around planning the event. Right. But I also don't believe those would have been events for millions without our broadcast layer. And so it was a wonderful partnership. And as they continue to roll out the return of open runs, we hope to be a long-term partner with them. They were an incredible partner in that. Uh, all the executives there are completely committed to the communities, completely committed to the space, and you know, committed to the brand. And one has never gone away. If you've been in a Walmart in America, and one has always been there. Always. Yeah. The merch, the merch has gone nowhere, even when you know the the the, the series kind of stopped circulating. Uh, they started doing the mail outs and, you know, stopped doing mail outs and things like that. And, um, the big pushes. So the interest is there. Even I think there's still a game, a recent game and one branded kind of uh, video game. My son plays all this stuff. I'm like, where are you playing? And one. All right, whatever. And it's really interesting. I love it. I love the longevity. I love that the timing was perfect for you to help uh, revitalize the public message and the public dissemination about what they were still continuing to do even after you know the media heyday and the, the major networks um 
went their separate ways, kind of so to speak. Um, just just like Streetball never went away, and one never went away. Right? There's yeah. been a committed customer base the entire time, and those are some of my favorite brands. Right? Like Vans is sit in a similar space, right outside of yeah. Streetball, which is like there's a moment when every model in the world is wearing Vans. There's a moment when every celebrity in the world is wearing Vans. But there is the day in and day out where like the hardcore skateboarder never stopped wearing bands. The hardcore musician never stopped wearing bands. And And One is very much a similar brand that way. Yeah, it is. Speaking of bands, uh, I was just reading the news story about the young pitcher that pitched a no hitter in bands that were converted to cleats. I was like, no way. Skater shoes on the, on the mound. That was pretty dope. So some great opportunities there for what you're doing. Greatest satisfaction for you, Jonathan? Unbelievable satisfaction. I mean, you know, I started my adult life as a as a musician in like a very vertical, you know, subgenre of music. I played punk rock. Okay. My first friends who actually achieved a level of fame were the Beastie Boys. Okay. And so I remember sitting in rooms in downtown New York, you know, with the Beastie Boys during their their initial rise. And being introduced to the world of hip hop and sort of seeing that hip hop had the same energy and largely the same belief system that punk rock did. Right. I mean, it's kind of like how the Beastie Boys made that transition. So naturally from being like a punk rock band to being like a hip hop brand and hip hop was kind of burned into my consciousness from those days. And it's never really gone away and it's only grown power, you know, again, as a father, like, like I remember right before the pandemic, taking my son to a hip hop photo show at the Annenberg center in Los Angeles. And just as a little kid, he was just transfixed by that like iconic image of Biggie Smalls with the crown. Right. And that image, I can't remember if that was the cover of vibe magazine potentially, but that image is as important this many years later as it was the moment it was captured and hip hop is as important to the culture and and just to be able to be part of this in like the smallest way, you know, as the CEO of of Clash TV is, is incredibly meaningful to me because it sort of feels in some ways like a full circle journey. Yeah, I yeah, I could I could see that it it's exciting to me. I will have some reason to watch basketball now. I started supporting, uh, you know, the other the other professional league. Uh, that's made the news yep. and uh, I, I love the philosophy there uh, and I love the philosophy about what Clash TV is doing so is there anything Jonathan that you wanted to cover that I, I may have neglected no I think you really bring an understanding of the space and what we're trying to do and I appreciate that and I appreciate your history and so you know thanks for the platform where you just let us talk about how we're here to you know grow audience and, you know, grow the community together. And and hopefully, you know, I'm a big, belie- big believer in doing good by doing well or doing well by doing good. Y- you know, the first thing I literally remember working on, and it's, a, it's about this full circle thing coming out of college, is I was working in an ad agency on the Timberland account. Mm. And, and Jeffrey Schwartz, who was the CEO of Timberland at the time, was a huge believer in like, doing well by doing good. And Timberland got behind the give races in the boot campaign at a time when, you know, Timberland boots were the hottest thing, you know, in urban areas in America. And I remember Timberland connected us with Def Jam. And again, sitting there in New York with Russell and Lior and run DMC and having them involved in that campaign and and being able to make a difference and, and sitting in this world like immediately after university. And it's funny because when I took this job, one of the first things I did for motivation is I went on eBay and I paid way, way, way too much money for one of those old Timberland give races in the boot shirts. Right. And I had it, and I had it framed in, you know, like a glass box and it sits behind my desk over my desk in my home office Wow. to sort of inspire me to bring, you know, that level of passion and belief and like trying to blend blend profit and you know productivity and and doing good all together. Yeah, you know, 
not to be petty, but them shadow boxes sometimes are like definitely overpriced. And uh, <laughs> yes, I don't necessarily want to tell you what I paid for the t-shirt, and I don't necessarily want to pay you what I <laughs> tell you what I paid the shadow box in. But you are correct. <laughs> I could get down with the t-shirt, whatever that is, because it's it's the collectors, it's what's what it's worth to you. I, I used to be a a, a a a framer at one of the big framing shops, the national chains, right? And I'm going, oh, we're making a whole lot of money on this joint of like, I need a raise. And so I'm just looking at it like shadow boxing it. And uh, as a, as a cheer dad, I'm shadow boxing, collecting uniforms and this, that, and the third of like, you know what? I would learn how to source my own joints and get back, get some presses and some glue and put these joints together. Anyway, I love it. I've had a great time with you, Jonathan, man. I, I would love to have you back. Um, and certainly we would love to have like, you know, uh, updates. And I know that it won't be you all the time, but we can keep the, keep the, the, the media come media announcements coming and I'll support, you know what I mean? Because I, I love the fact that, you know, the streets have not been forgotten. Our street ballers have not been forgotten. And, streetball culture, which is as much of a culture and powerful culture as is hip hop, you know, it should, it should continue. It's something that's uniquely American. It comes from the city streets here and uh, having people like yourself champion it and your network um, is an amazing thing. We love to support. So thank you so much. Appreciate I'm you. gonna say I'm gonna say very little else because I think I couldn't say it as eloquently as you just said it. So <laughs> we'll leave it there. But I would love to be back when we have news about the fall and the next piece of this basketball ecosystem that we'll be looking to enter. Amazing. All right, everybody. The Hype Magazine live sessions. Jonathan Anastas. Hey, Clash TV. Fat Joe. What? Streetball Commissioner. It's only right, and it is. Hip hop. Till next time, we're out. Thank you. Thank you so much. As an artist, we should reflect the time. Why you so talented? Because I'm black. Why you so amazing? Because I'm black. It's really important that we build characters. So that people understand their story matters. Two Chains and I both are just really into good food. And when you know you are royalty, you will only aim in life to be royalty. We're doing it right now. I don't give a damn what they say about me. Yes, I called your ass out. I know I shouldn't be saying this kind of Shout out to Hype Magazine Network. Shout out to the Hype Magazine Network.